afternoon. This is Q&A with Dima. Actually, today is with two Dimas because we've got a wonderful guest with us, Dima Slobodinuk, the music director of the Orchestra La Carunia, also Lahti. And we'll talk about the theme of this talks, which is the transformation, art of reinvention in the time of the pandemic. So welcome, Dima. Wonderful to have you here. Thank you, Dima. Wonderful to be here, and thanks for inviting me. Two Dimas is, is, a, is a rare uh, occasion, but of course, one is a lot older. And uh, I know you from your still teenage years. You must have been 17 when you came uh, to Vasa, to Course Home Festival, uh, to where I was already artistic director for a number of years. And because your father was one of the founding members of the NAS Chamber Orchestra. And then he took a position in Vaza. You moved, you and your mom, who still lives in Vaza, uh, moved in 1991, I believe. Yeah, so that's almost, well, now it's exactly uh, 40 years. 40 years ago, you moved to Vaza. Um, 30, 30 years um, in, the, in the autumn of this year, but actually, well, of course, it's of course thirty years. No, what am I years, saying? Yeah. It's thirty okay. years. Yeah, yeah, of course. They came yeah. slightly before me. They moved like in the, in the autumn of ninety one, and um, I came in January of ninety two. Kind of in the, oh, in the in the middle of the term, school term. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Tell me, uh, because of course, once you moved to Vaza, and we saw each other quite often for a while. Uh, I know you from that age, but what to, I, I'm, I'm very interested about your early years in Moscow and who were your teachers, where you went to school, the background, talk about your family, if you could fill me in on that. Yeah, I'm actually becoming more and more interested myself in those early years, you know, it's, it's kind of the, the, the further you go, the more you start thinking about the past and uh, it becomes, in my case, it becomes uh, more and more interesting that actually why am I the way the, the way I am <laughs> so, so I'm, I'm, asking, I'm asking a lot of questions as well and not great. not not always really getting uh, the answers but I think many times asking questions is, is more important than actually getting the answers um, well I mean I started playing violin uh, at the age of five I think and my first teacher was Zinaida uh, Giles, but not for long. So, because she, she left to US. And so when I actually entered the Central Music School, I was already studying with uh, Evgenia Chugaeva. And with her, I studied for numbers, year, number of years, um, actually for as long as I studied in that school. Because then uh, I think uh, from the eighth grade, um, I switched to, uh, to the um, Conservatory Music uh, College, which was called Merzlikovskaya. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, oh, well, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. so I spent actually two years in the Merzlikovskaya school and then one and a half year in Merzlikovskaya Uchilishe from where I actually left to Finland. Uh, and... Um, and there, my teacher were uh, her surname was Slavianova uh, for a few years. And uh, when I came to Finland, all the way up to my degree in Sibelius Academy. So first, I studied um, four years in Uvascula, that's central Finland, with Olga Parhomenko. Uh, she was uh, one of the first uh, pupils of David Oyster. And I actually never changed. So I studied with her for nine years, I think, um, and uh, graduated from Sibelius Academy with her as well. And that's it. So, yeah. so as, a violinist, as, a, as a violinist, you, you had really only Russian teachers, first yeah. in, in Moscow, but then also a Russian teacher like Olga Prachomenko belonged to David Oyster's school. But of course, your early ones 
uh, both Chugaeva and Zinaida Gilis, they were the assistants of uh, my teacher, Yuri Yankilevich. So they belong to that great school, which came from Abram Yampolsky and so forth. So you've, you've had wonderful teachers all along and always, always Russian, which we will later talk about your conducting teacher, but, but that, that uh, teachers and influences, but that comes later. So you came from a very, very good uh, Russian uh, violin school. Yes, and actually the interesting thing with Parhomenko is that though she was a David Oster student, she was extremely interesting in Yankelevich school and she was following her, uh, his uh, lectures and, and uh, lessons constantly, like um, based on which she in a way created her own school because what, we, what happened with me um, when I started studying with her, studying with her was uh, we basically took everything apart and started rebuilding from scratch. Yes. So, so, so whatever she actually, it was very, the way she um, taught, um, you know, technical kind of the, the, the approach relationship to the instrument, uh, the physical aspect of, of all these, I think it was, it was, if anything, more close to Yankelevich school. Mm -hmm. so, <clears throat> so I guess I'm really more like belonging from, from it, to that uh, camp. So yeah, I understand. I understand. Tell about your uh, parents. Of course, your father. We will speak uh, especially because I I got to know him very very well and I knew him for a long time. But also your mother's side has the wonderful distinguished musicians. Mm, yes. Well, I guess I didn't have very much choice what to do in the age of five. Uh, you know, instead of because um, my well, I come. Kind of, I think it's it's a fair thing to say that I come from a viola player's family. Uh, so my grandfather, <laughs> and I'm really proud of that. But uh, so my grandfather's, uh, my grand, no, my, my mother's father was principal viola of Moscow Field, and uh, uh, from certain period onwards, my father played with him on the same stand. He was assistant principal. So that's how I remember. That was completely like, you know, drinking water in the morning. That, of course, my father and my grandfather sit in the, on the same stand in the orchestra. But later I realized that it might not be such a thing, you know, to be taken for granted. <laughs> and so, it doesn't always work out well. Yeah. <laughs> but no, in this exactly, case, yeah. <laughs> and uh, my yeah. grandmother was playing in the opera studio of Moscow uh, Conservatory. So that, that's an or orchestra which, in a way, served as a material for conducting students uh, in, in the Moscow Conservatory for, uh, you know, the practical you know, aspects of rehearsing and, above all, preparing opera productions. So that, that was the, but again, violinist, then my grandfather was viola player, father, my father viola player, again, my mother is... He's a pianist, and then actually the, my grandmother's sister and her husband were also uh, musicians. Uh, she, she was, uh, well, um, her husband was the professor of uh, Bali, and, and she was a pianist, a very good one. So uh, I don't think there was, there was a single member of my family who didn't have anything to do with, uh, you know, music. Music. everybody. So it's, a, it's a real musical dynasty. And... Uh, uh, when you come from kind of background, of course, music, uh, like in my family, I, I, it was not anything that uh, you could be dis it could be described as a job. Not it's much more than a profession, as well. It's uh, it's a way of life, really. Yeah, it's the air and oxygen without which we simply cannot uh, survive. And, uh, you know, just jumping to today's situation, we'll come back to when you yeah. came to Finland in a minute, but, but it's so to break the historical thing, um, there's always a question I ask, uh, which is relevant to all of us, especially to the ones who, to whom making music, living music is just as important as breathing. So how have you 
uh, survived the last year of the pandemic where that very, very uh, a, a profession, that very activity was really halted, was really stopped. And uh, we still have not conquered the situation yet. Now there is a hope with vaccines and this and that. Some countries do better, some countries don't do well at all. But in your personal view, how did you cope? Have you been able to make music, rehearse, conduct, or, you know, be in touch with your fellow? How did it affect you that last year? Mm, yeah, first of all, let me catch the last word. Um, it did affect me and it still does. Uh, still does. I think exactly. we have very far away from uh, being able to, you know, make a statement that it's all behind us. Mm, um, let's start with the positive um, part of this. Um, I've been thinking of um, taking a sabbatical for some time before uh, pandemic started. So if anything, it just simply helped me make a decision, which I didn't have to do. You know, I didn't have to make that decision. It just happened. So, and I really needed it. I, I now, only now I understand how really, how much I really needed. And so a certain kind of um, reset, um, reboot, you know, like in, in, a, in a case of, of a computer, uh, you know, some hard disks you have to switch off, pull out of the electricity, electricity and wait. So that, that's what happened in my case, because I mean, like, if you stop, you keep going for another two months in your head and you're in your system. So to really feel that, okay, you've cleared the, the cachet uh, and uh, you've re reset and you are ready to move on or to create something new or uh, to, you know, to advance. It took many months. At the same time, it you know when 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 you really when I really felt that okay, I'm now I've stopped and I feel peaceful. I feel you know very good with myself. And at the same time, it started really getting into me uh, that 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 you know that you don't have any idea when are you going to be able to make music again. And. Um, um, yeah, at some point it was almost physical uh, pain of not being able to touch the sound with your hands. Yeah. Um, that's, that's what I enjoy so much now when I'm able to work. Those, those moments when the, when the music starts sounding and I really feel it here, you know, N not, not only in my ears, uh, but I, I have physical contact with the sound and uh, that was for me the most difficult thing, not being able to do that. But again, let's turn it onto the more uh, positive note. I have two orchestras uh, which were able to function um, almost constantly. In both cases, we had, of course, a, a complete stop uh, until May, well, May, June 2020, which after we started, you know, doing something. But again, that stop was also brought to, uh, there was a lot of planning, a lot of um, <clears throat> brainstorming, which was not easy because no, no one of us was ever taught or prepared to function in this kind of situation. You know, you have a symphony orchestra and you, you're supposed to make it function without, first of all, seeing, without seeing people and without having any chance of performing anything for anyone. So, you know, but here we are alive and kicking. That's right. And, 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 and hopefully also making some plans for a better future when, when finally that, um, that, that, that virus will be conquered, which I'm sure it will uh, eventually with a, with a, you know, full vaccination of, as, as many people as possible. And we'll, hopefully one day we'll just be able to once a year, like a flu shot, you know, to get that boosted uh, yeah. vaccine once uh, 
a year, and then we are no, no longer vulnerable. That's the idea. That's sort of the, the good plan. Now, how long is it to that moment? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. And of course, as you know, because you've traveled uh, m much more than me in the last year, normally I travel ridiculous amount, but this time it was just absolutely minimal. But now I'm preparing uh, to travel again at the end of April. And it's just, uh, as I said, it's a combination of Chinese puzzle and steeplechase. Yeah. <laughs> you know, steeplechase yeah. is where you have to jump, again, you know, with barriers and then fall into water and this. And that. I mean, it's just ridiculous. And so much of it is unknown because you don't, you don't know the change. There. But in any case, with, I would be just happy to, to, be going, to be going through it. Now, let's come back to the moment when we, uh, when we met or when you came. It must have been uh, the first country outside or certainly first Western country outside of Russia that you uh, encountered when you came to Finland. You hadn't been up till 91 or 92. You hadn't been abroad, right? Up to 91 summer, when um, the whole thing in uh, Moscow, you know, with the political turnover uh, happened. Exactly during those days, I was first time abroad with my dad at the festival of Aix-en-Provence. Aix-en-Provence, you were. I see, I see, I see, I see, I see. Uh, was you know the... you were playing? Was it... Was it was it not Ex in Provence in in uh, all well, it was not Ex in Provence. You were the, you were in La Roque d'Anteron. He brought you exactly. to La Roque, no La Roque but I think we stayed or the orchestra stayed in Ex in Provence, which is nearby. That's why you remember yes. it as being Ex exactly. in Provence. But in fact, the concerts were in um, La Roque d'Anteron. We also had one trip to another festival in um, Alp Maritime. I don't know whether you, you came to that or not really high sure. on mountains. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, it was a summer. It was August 91. Yes. That's, that's what we were, yeah. So it was, so you'd been to France. That's lovely. Now you came to live in a completely new country, in a completely new language, mentality, and oh, how quickly did you adjust and what uh what were your impressions because as it turned out you know vaza uh which you've known since you know since then almost 30 years uh became a very important city for you hmm. that's the city where your father got the job where the course home festival was with the artistic director and then also, uh, I think you were, you were also the chief conductor of Vasa Orchestra for, for, for a little while. <clears throat> principal guest for a couple of years. Just a guest, yeah, principal guest. So it was also kind of the beginning of your, of your symphony conducting and your mom still lives there. So yes. there is a lot, of, a lot of, you have an incredible sort of perspective of life in this town for 30 years, but what were your first impressions? What, how could you sort of adapt and reconcile between the, those two cultures, between the two systems and all of that? It all happened quite quickly. Um, I, in fact, I think a little bit too quickly to be able to adjust as you go. Um, I think I remember it being rather dark and I, I don't think that's a fantasy. I think it really was really dark. Uh, oh, January, it was <laughs> January 26th when I came. Uh, and, uh, you know, in the first years, we actually did not live in Vasa. We lived in, in Solf, which is a little village Solf, yeah. ne next to Vasa. I don't know exactly how many thousands of people live there still. I think it's slightly bigger now, but it's, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a village. And uh, lots of snow and uh, cold and dark. But somehow, you know, this um, paradise-like clearness of air and something extremely clear, you know, also on the more general level. Um, somehow every, everything became more spaced, you know. Um, 
not congested, not packed in a, in a box. Everything started, you know, um, created some kind of spectrum which you could see actually. Um, life was quite hectic in Moscow, as you know very well. Um, and it was completely the contrary there. I don't think there can be any, any more substances which you could uh, compare and, and, you know, like create this kind of contrast. Uh, completely white, black and white. And, and, um, and a lot of changes um, occurred at, at the same time because as we moved to Finland, uh, I also, like in a few months, I, I moved to US to study. So I changed the country and, and I, I moved to another city to live alone. So age of 17, I think it's fine. It's not particularly too, too early. I mean, some people do it even earlier, but it's, um, it's a fairly challenging age to start your you know, personal kind of life on your own. So all that added up to being, you know, a good package of things to digest during the next 10 years. So a lot of changes, but uh, you know, you survive, then that's how you become stronger. I think it's very well said, what doesn't kill you just makes you stronger. I guess it's very often, very often like this. Obviously I didn't, I was not facing any dangers. It's, it's a very safe country with very friendly people, but as you yeah. said, very different uh, mentality and, and culture, uh, both on the street and uh, in, the, in the music education. So <clears throat> a lot of questions needed from to be my part, From my part, observing you uh, after a few years there, because we would keep seeing each other after even after i left the course home in 93 uh i would come back to finland of course for concerts and we would meet where they would be helsinki or uviskule even before or whatever we would always and then later on you invited me to olu when you were there as a music director we we would always it, from my part i always observed how you uh transformed changed your character, your, not physically, physically you were always, you know, good looking, handsome, tall uh, young man. You know, now you have a beard, so you're beginning to look like I maybe uh, looked, uh, you know, 40 years younger. But <laughs> anyway, but uh, the thing, the thing that I, I knew that you were absorbing also a characteristic of the Finnish character, because you were in the Finnish, you know, you were much quieter than a normal Russian young man of your age, uh, or Moscovite, yeah, as well, always, you know, a little bit like New Yorkers or the big city people, you know, always busy and, you know, kind of aggressive in the, even in the positive sense, but impatient, let's put it this way, not necessarily mm -hmm. aggressive, but it was very different. You, you were, very composed, quiet, and you've absorbed a lot of a lot of characteristics which are very, very typical for that very magical and special country that uh, Finland is. And that that was interesting. If you looked at yourself today, because then later on you moved also to Spain, we're jumping now over certain decades, but and I'm sure you've absorbed from your uh, work with a Spanish orchestra, but do you still, for instance, do you feel that you represent, you feel yourself that you're a Russian artist or more Finnish or Scandinavian Nordic artist, or now you require something Southern as, as Spanish as well? How do you, as you said, you now you look in the mirror and you want the answers where you come from, but how do you feel? You feel that you're an artist, Russian artists living abroad, uh, you don't perform in Russian, not yet. And uh, you see yourself as a result of all these influences. Um, I think the easiest and the more kind of the most clear way to, to look at that is through music. 
um, because otherwise it becomes really complicated because I'm, I'm, a, I'm a mess of you know, all the cultures. Um, but uh, through music, you know, it's like a language. Um, the language you speak at the moment is the one you normally would think in, right? I mean, you can't really oh, yeah. speak English thinking in Russian or for yes. sure you can't, you can't speak Finnish uh, thinking in Russian or in English. So, so I guess it, it really depends. Um, as it as everything was quite new to me, so I did not dare take, for example, Finnish repertoire into my into my concert programs for uh, some time. Uh, the interesting thing of me becoming artistic director of Sibelius Festival was uh, a nice addition to the <laughs> to the package. And uh, and I was really honored to be to you know to have been offered that, and then suddenly you just, you become uh, so familiar with that music that it actually feels like your own. So me performing, let's say Sibelius Symphony somewhere abroad, feels like I'm bringing something of my own. And I guess that maybe partly answers your question uh, that it doesn't really follow any patterns it's it's very case sensitive um you know i'm i guess i'm all that uh, um, if i'm doing russian music i feel very russian very russian and then sometimes um i have this you know who was it who said about the interpretation of uh, tchaikovsky that you know don't try to make russian music too russian or um so, so I guess if I have to represent some kind of, you know, um, a stream in, uh, in interpretation of Russian music, that's that's me. I don't want it to sound too Russian uh, because that's not what it was, you know, how it was conceived. And oh. I guess let's not get there. It's it's a long discussion, but uh, oh, absolutely. But, <clears throat> but but I, I'm proud to be known of the three and at the same time all the all three at the same time so um it's really one day it's like this and another day it's it's something different and uh, and, and i feel very much depends on what what you're working on and what's the repertoire and i think that's that's basically that's how it should be in the world of music because i mean if we start really looking at the history uh Tchaikovsky, which uh, uh, so many in the West, especially in America, in particular, you know, they think all oh, they think they they love Tchaikovsky's music, but they very often take him completely wrong because for Tchaikovsky, uh, his god was Mozart, exactly. One. Maybe second god was Schumann, exactly. and he composed most of his best works in Italy. <laughs> so that's how Russian he was, and in Russia, he was not considered a Russian composer at all. He was uh, by the mighty five, by Mussorgsky, Rimsky, Korsakov, and the rest, Borodin. They thought he was the most Western of, of the Russian composers. So there, <laughs> so it's already a contradiction back 150 plus years, you know, so it's, it's it, but it's, it's interesting how, you know, how wrong all those labels, uh, when you, you come in, oh yeah, that's a Russian violinist or Russian conductor. No, first of all, I was never Russian in Russia. In Russia, I was Jewish. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. As Let's soon start as with I that. left <laughs> Russia, exactly. As soon as I left Russia, all of a sudden I became Russian. Now, you know, some people when they hear me talk, they think I'm American. So if they don't like America, they, they, I will be, you know, I will always be in minority no matter what. <laughs> so and I'm sure yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> But maybe we're lucky. Maybe we're lucky being, you know, being in between the the kind of the continents and in between the, the yeah. borders of the products. I mean, we all we all have this tendency of creating products and uh, or uniting things into one package and calling it something. It uh, really does not serve any purpose for most of the time, especially in music. Uh, you can talk about styles, but uh, each composer has so strong uh, personal history that sometimes it's really hard to um, to connect it to a history 
of one country or one society. By the way, Sibelius is also a very, very good example of that. I mean, he has a lot of European influences just because, you know, he, he spent a lot of time there. And uh, by the way, Italy was also present very uh, in, in, in his like the second symphony is composed there. And uh, well, I mean, it's enough to look at the score. Actually, both of Tchaikovsky or Sibelius. I mean, if you look at it, you understand that this, this is the language which Brahms used. It's the same kind of the same structure, the same bricks, uh, though har harmonically completely something different, which makes Sibelius Sibelius. <clears throat> and, the, and then there is, of course, a very, uh, is, is something very uh, Russian influenced in Sibelius because oh, yeah. he was such good friends. You know, he, first of all, he was very close to Russia and Finland was uh, part of the Russian empire at that time. And his very often drinking companion and a good friend was Glazunov. You know, there are yeah. famous drinking parties that went on for days, if not weeks, you know, yes. anything else. More like, so, yeah, more, yeah, more like weeks actually. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, more like weeks, exactly. So you know, it's very, it's it's an interesting, it's it's an interesting uh, uh, point of, you know, interconnecting, uh, and the and the where, what culture all of a sudden played, if not direct influence, then maybe practical influence for, uh, you know, who 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 thinks today that, uh, the Goldberg variations perhaps the greatest piece ever written by Bach and maybe one of the most extraordinary pieces was actually a commission and paid for mm -hmm. uh, by the Russian consul, Kaiserling, <laughs> who lived in Dresden. So there is this Russian connection. And how many people remember saying so many times, Razumovsky Quartet, and this and that, that Razumovsky, Count Razumovsky paid, uh, you know, a lifelong uh, stipend for the for string players, which formed Razumovsky Quartet, specifically yeah. to play every new quartet that Beethoven wrote, as long as he was writing. So you know, if, these if, things if, don't if, happen very often nowadays, do they? Not not as often as in those, but still, I, I, let let's hope for something. Now, speaking of in, influences, uh, interesting. Yeah, just before. One of our friends whose uh, question I wrote now, there's one that's being asked uh, by somebody you know, Mimi. So who okay. is the Russian composer considered Russian by Russians themselves and other? Who stayed till the end? <laughs> that's a good question. A quintessential Russian composer. You go first and then I'll, I might add or Whatever, which considered, good. Which considered okay, but but who stayed doesn't really mean anything. You know, you can stay and still be, yeah. <laughs> still be. Um, <laughs> I don't know. It's it's uh, it's hard to say. I mean, you could say, uh, you know, you could talk about Prokofiev, um, but I wouldn't go that far. Um, no, and uh, How about his French period. His French period and his American period. He exactly. he, he was away from Russia from eighteen from two uh, from nineteen eighteen to nineteen thirty five. Really, and I, I mean, he I mean when he came managed. back, yeah, when he came back. It was I mean, I mean, this is probably uh, the worst example. But again, this is the maybe the quintessentially the most cl the closest Russian composer to me. Uh, from all, from all of them, um, and I I connect as a Russian person to Russian culture through his music, and that's weird. Maybe because no, he just he <laughs> un underwent something similar as uh, I have. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, but um, and to be honest, uh, a composer like Borodin, for example. Yeah, Rimsky. He was half Georgian, by the way. Who, yeah. He was half Georgian. He was a, a legitimate son of a Georgian prince. Uh, I would say Mussorgsky, probably. 
maybe the most the most russian uh mm -hmm. uh not not just because he drank so much not because he was also <laughs> a genius composer uh but never finished much but he wrote some such russian music and in the 20th century um well the one who was a true patriot and 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 maybe a beethoven like figure for the russian music certainly was shostakovich yeah. who really reflected the whole most of the 20th century in his music i think maybe and he actually had a very close uh, kinship with with Mussorgsky. I think he he he, he orchestrated yeah. uh, uh, several things, Kovanshina, yeah. you know, the yeah. opera, and, and he and and, and uh, uh, dances and um, song and dances of death and yeah, a lot yeah. of a lot yeah. of things. He he felt very keenly. Yeah. I would I would put those two, because it's certainly not Glinka who spent most of his time abroad, either in Spain yeah. or Italy. And it's, uh, as we talked about Borodin, even Rimsky Korsakov, who was a naval officer, who knows? You know, I would say... By the way, from... do, you know, do you know that Rimsky Korsakov actually uh, spent quite many years here in Ferrol, in Galicia? Uh, really? It's like, it's like uh, one hour by car from here. Wow, I didn't so, know that. Yeah. Of course, Capriccio, Capriccio Espanol, which I love very much and performed in in spain with several oxes i yeah. lo I, lo I love that piece he really had a, he had a yes. feel for it so i hope we answered mimi and now another question from the same group from nes this is from ron efrat he said what was the direct influence both personal and musical of your beloved father on you such a colorful personality i know that i learned ron as his colleague and stand partner never Pan, deep breath, clear your head, and trust your assistant always. <laughs> yeah, that's a wonderful tribute. Of course, for those who don't know, uh, Vale Valentin Slobodinuk was a wonderful violist. He was, as you mentioned earlier, uh, you know, in the first stand of Moscow Philharmonic uh, Orchestra, and then when he joined the NAS and came to Vaza, he was offered. Uh, a, a position would change his life and the life of his family, of his son, who is our guest today. And he played uh, wonderfully in all the groups of NES and, of course, Vaza Symphony until his untimely death uh, at the beginning of this century. So, what did you take uh, as a direct influence, personal and musical, from Valentin? Mm. Um. I think when you are growing up as a baby, um, you don't choose what you take and what you don't. Uh, you just absorb everything. And uh, as I noticed with my kids, um, especially with my older son, who starts, starts showing certain qualities, which are more, you know, not so much of a, of a baby anymore. He, he will turn nine this year. And I just sometimes, uh, to an extent that I, I get slightly scary, that how much has he absorbed, not only of certain you know, ways to express things, uh, but to behave and what his teachers are telling me you know, from the school of, of the way he kind of uh, interacts with, with kids, the way he learns. Um, I'm, I'm really proud of him and uh, proud that, that I'm his father and he's my son. Um, and I, I think, and I'm sh sure that the same thing happened with my, with my dad. Okay, something is starting updating in my computer. Let's hope this will not uh, cut. No, no, I could hear you. I okay. think, I think you're, still, you're still okay, yeah. All right, I just don't see you at the moment, but let's see if I can get you back. All right, All right. now. I can hear it. <coughs> no problem. So, um, yeah, he was um, he was a person with a soft calmness, but really firm hand. You know, like he took time to make decisions. He thought about things. He didn't talk very much. When he did, I think he really meant um, that. Makes an impression, you know, on a on a younger. 
person, especially if you're being his son. And uh, I'm happy to feel and to to really to say that I I somehow inherited that. And I'm the further I go, the more I miss you because you know you you reach certain age uh, that you really wish that okay I would love to share this thing with him would have loved to and uh, it's uh, what 18 years now since he's gone so in in a, in a way um, um, I miss him as a friend more and more now and uh, uh, he's been very in you know, the, the decision actually to leave Russia for Finland was of course his. Yeah. Um, we all, you know, participated oh. in that. But he was very firm in that, in the sense that he really wanted to uh, live in Finland. That was the country, one of the first countries he also saw and visited many times, also through NAS. And uh, somehow he felt that there is a there is a vibe which feels like home. And he, he was very good in following his gut feeling. You know, it's, uh, I'm also very grateful for that because I'm noticing that, that more and more, I don't know, maybe it's bad, but I'm making decisions based on my gut. Um, be, because uh, somehow everything is based on information, facts nowadays. And if you do not follow those uh, guidelines, uh, you are slightly off you know, offset from the, from the way people expect you to function. But sometimes, yeah. you know, you get much more by following your, your gut feeling, which means that it's, it's also your intuition. That's what we do in music. After you've get, gathered all the information, all the facts, all the history, that doesn't make for an interpretation. Um, that all needs to, you know, come through you, through the filter, become something which no one else does. So uh, I guess that's from him. And, and um, yeah, he's been a, a wonderful, wonderful person. And uh, musically also, he tried to teach me, Valina, I'm saying, I say tried because it's hard in, in the family. Uh, I, know, I know there are some good examples when, you know, children study for decades with their parents or one of the parents. Uh, but I we had one such case two weeks ago. Yes, Boris Garvitsky, who exactly every, yes every day for ten years with his wonderful there you father, go. father. That 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 is unique. I I don't know any anyone else who's actually been so steadily taught by your parent by any yeah you know. yeah. So that that is a world record, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the yeah. one that I, I've, I've never, I've never heard of uh, anybody with, with that degree of intense consistency. Yeah, you know, because exactly. and also it it tells you about uh, both of their natures, because you know you would have so many points where you the 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 older you are, you know, from six, okay, you don't argue so much. But at 12, at 13, even before, you have, I remember I, I had diametrically uh, uh, opposed, uh, you know, to, to my great mom. I, if she couldn't even begin to, to, to give me a lesson for 10 minutes, let alone for two hours every day. And she, she was one of the, you know, greatest pianists. But it doesn't matter because I just don't, I disagree. So that just, you know, that shows how, incredibly yeah. peaceful and respectful and somehow but that's that's just a, an example it's an exception that proves the rule that basically yeah, yes, yes. That, that's probably very well said yeah exactly yeah. exactly yeah so now uh of course we remember and we'll always remember Vale, and i think the older we get the more we will look back and hopefully also that is very special group and he asked when we hopefully make our way, not this summer, but the summer after that, to the place of our birth, of the birth of NES in, in Course Home, we will absolutely have a special spiritual and musical reunion with Valia and uh, mm. remember him in the most 
in the most special. Even with Vasa Symphony, when I was there, uh, of course, after he was gone already, and I made a return maybe in 2012, so it must have been 10 years yeah. um, of his passing. And we did a concert with his colleagues who played with him, uh, you know, all those years. And we did also Rachmaninov vocal. Hmm. How, how special that piece and, you know, my transcription for strings, but he, he played it many times with me and they played it very beautifully. And there was, I felt that he was there in town hall yeah. with us. And I'm sure he follows you with great, mm, great feeling of proud father and, and, and a sense of great accomplishment because the move you justified all his big decisions, which take, uh, you know, when you said about gut making decisions based on gut, I think those are the most courageous things because it's easy now to calculate, you know, you can do statistical analysis and this and that, all these, you know, platforms that will give you statistics, you know, the likes, the dislikes, yeah. the views, yeah. no views, but it's all cold. In spite of all of that, you have to have a feel for it. As you were saying, you know, based on that, I remember a story when I wanted to go to my very last competition, uh, the Chrysler competition, and I was already, I had a wonderful manager who set me up already in the uh, winner's uh, series at Hercules Zal, which was ultimately more important than the competition, to be just to be part of that series. And he said, Dima, why do you want to go? Uh, to another competition, you know, there is a risk. There's no guarantee that you would win. I said, absolutely not. Uh, but I said, you know, but I have a good feeling about it. Mm. It's a it's a gut thing. It, there's no guarantee. I mean, competitions, God knows. It's a real, uh, you know, uh, roulette kind of thing. Right. Yeah. Uh, but if you have a right feeling about it, I think you should just, do it and i would that's one of the biggest uh and most important i think lessons that you could learn from your father is to trust your gut feeling yeah. now once you became a conductor uh now of course you are a very busy conductor before the pandemic of course you were going and even now you have still some of the plans that hopefully now will become will be postponed but whatever uh, up until pandemic you performed very often as a guest conductor. And I often wonder, since I've been with so many different orchestras throughout my long concert life, both as violinist and a conductor, uh, these days I feel that, uh, and the question that I refer to is this, um, what can a guest conductor do within the limited rehearsal time, code, of behavior, which means that you're not allowed to change really anything seriously, not even the seating of the orchestra very often. Uh, so it becomes kind of like an exercise of renting a car. You're giving the keys from the car, you've given it a, a week to stay with that car, depending on the number of performances, and then you're supposed to return it without any accidents, without any changes, don't change the oil, don't just, just refill it with gas and, <laughs> and drop off the keys kind of thing. Now, in order to have mutually satisfying experience where everyone can discover something, I mean, you put in a very narrow kind of possibilities. How do you deal with it? What's your view on that? <laughs> That's an interesting one. Um, I think... Uh... If you think about the rental car pattern before you go guest conduct somewhere, um, I mean, I'm talking hypothetically. Of course, of course. Um, um, I think it's better not to do that. It's, That's true. It, I agree. it just doesn't make any sense. Uh, because first, first of all, um, if you think of a, an orchestra who invites a conductor for a guest conducting week, they are interested in that conductor to do something musically with the orchestra. Many times the process of selection of guest conducting, uh, of guest conductors is very complicated. Um, it's, it's a puzzle. It's like, because I, I'm on both sides. I'm both planning 
and doing it myself. So, um, so if I would see that a conductor comes to my orchestra, spends one week without changing anything, behaving very well and correctly performing all the pieces which he's supposed to do that, I don't think I would like to see him again because it doesn't make, you know, for a, you know, you want someone to make your, or your orchestra better or to bring something, uh, you know, something new. So I would not be too careful with that. And um, of course, you have to think about certain things which you don't by default touch in the, in the orchestra where you have never been before. Uh, but that's the same process you would do or you would follow in your own orchestra as well. So before changing anything, you, you're trying to achieve something with, with the material which you have. So a guest conductor, I think even now with the, all the, well, let's think, forget about pandemic uh, for, for a second. Um, let's say that yeah. the ma market is very active, full, over, I don't know, overloaded, over. Um, so you have to bring something of your own. Uh, if you're trying to be the correctly perfect guest conductor, no one is really interested in, in that. So even if things don't go very well, um, or it feels like that, but you are honestly doing your thing, I think that's enough. That's enough. You, 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 know, you, you have to be careful with the pieces. I think that's actually more essential than the way you behave. What you choose as, a, as, as a, and I've had both very, very positive and rather negative experiences based on the choice of repertoire. So that, that question is more, um, it affects the outcome of a guest conducting week sometimes more than actual process. So, um, so I, I would say um, yeah. renting a car in a way, yes, but um, I'd like to approach it in a more daring way. So, so that guest conductor is actually someone who is not bound by a, you know certain that you actually you come in a in a best case or worst case I don't know uh, no one knows you and you're just doing your thing yeah and uh, yeah and many times it, it happens so that you are being offered a position of music director based on one guest conducting week so I guess something did go well in that case and then sometimes of it's course it, it's, the, it's the is the country. <clears throat> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, it's it's a very delicate, as you said, and multifaceted uh, 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 profession because one, you don't always have, or a guest conductor very often doesn't have a choice of a repertoire because it's been chosen for him. You know, it, or we need somebody for this, mm. and we need the soxon needs this, and the choice of the soloist very often is also not. Mm. uh determined you know uh but that's 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 a whole other uh set of questions and problems but you're absolutely right the best thing is to bring yourself your vision hopefully your sound which doesn't need even uh, technically speaking reseating of the orchestra though it helps yeah. for me one of the one of the main uh, one of the biggest impressions that I've had as a conductor or even before I became a conductor was when I saw, I'm sure you saw that, uh, Earl, it was a long time ago already, the Art of Conducting video, Yeah, you know, which had some great, great conductors, of course, uh, even from Nikish silently, uh, you know, Karian and Bernstein, all the famous ones. But then uh, they showed Stokowski in front of BBC Orchestra. And you heard Philadelphia sound. Hmm. It was unbelievable. I mean, BBC never sounded like that before or since. Hmm. It was just Stokowski brought his own sound. He once not terribly modestly uh, uh, replied when they when he went to Hollywood sound uh, to Hollywood uh, to uh, to work on Fantasia. They said, "Oh, but you know, what about the Philadelphia sound?" He said, "Philadelphia sound, that's me." He said, pointed at himself. And he was right. In his case, that was absolutely so. So I thought, wow, what a 
what a fantastic concept that he actually brought that sound wherever he went. You know, of course, it was not always so simple because he used to receive people in the most unorthodox way. But this sound quality that he got was absolutely unique. And that was one of the biggest attraction for me for the rest of my conducting uh, life because I always dream of bringing my own sound to any orchestra. Yeah. Of course, you know, the better the orchestra, the better chances. But sometimes, you know, very, very top orchestras, to change their sound sometimes is the hardest. Be, you know, you can change styles easier because they're much more versatile in different styles. But to change the very basic sound is is much harder, isn't it? Oh, that, yes, it's the, the, the higher the, the level, um, the less you kind of you the less you change, you know, to change you, you just. But again, you get another thing, which is. Those orchestras can read your body language in, exactly. in in a different way, perhaps, as another orchestra where you have to actually rehearse to make them sound differently. Um, and um, I guess it's also piece sensitive. You know, depending on what kind of music you're you're doing, if, if that yeah. music has been performed a lot, a lot in that orchestra um, of of that top class you're talking about, uh, then you need to. Um, get them motivated to do something. But again, I think, and most of my experiences were very positive. People really are are thirsty to make things uh, kind of freshly in a new way. And uh, otherwise, if it if it becomes a renting car, then it's a recycling. Then. Not much is happening. Mm. Yeah, not much is happening. Absolutely. Now, as a music director, because you've been a music director for a long time already, I certainly can remember from old that was already what at least fifteen years ago, if not if not even early. Mm. I don't remember when when you yeah. were there. Yeah, uh, all of was from two thousand five to two thousand eight. So there you go, sixteen years. 16 years ago. Yeah. Exactly, and then it went on. So, and you've been a very successful music director from what I could tell in La Coruña and the way the orchestra is with you. So what are the secrets? Now, the question here uh, is this, how much of an impact can a modern music director make on an orchestra in today's changing climate of making decisions by committee as opposed to the dictatorial powers of the bygone era? Um, well, I don't think uh, or I guess I'm lucky not to be part of uh, of the um, kind of uh, institutions where decisions are are being made by committees only. I actually in in both orchestras, I was the one. I still am the one who decides who comes, uh, what we play, what we don't play, and uh, of course all that is being constantly adjusted to the budget and uh, to the um, well. Um, planning a season is a, is a, is a puzzle, uh, but at least I felt that I did have a, a strong say in both case, in both cases. So, um, yeah, I would think it's similar to guest conducting. Um, you are chosen as a music director to make an impact on the orchestra, period. If you don't, uh, you should leave. Uh, I think that's that's just uh, it, it, it's slightly it's slightly black and white, but that's how I see it, and that's how I try to function myself. At the moment when I'll I'll see that my impact is not being um, carried all the way through, and, and 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 the orchestra actually sounds the way I want them to sound, uh, then um, you start thinking about about different possibilities. Yeah, but but yeah, I mean, we are. This is the whole thing about conducting. It's um, the orchestras have become strong and uh, with a lot of initiative, which is fantastic thing. It's very important. But again, this is not like in our modern society where, at times, decisions are spread over large group of people, and at this, um, you know, uh, at the end, no one is really responsible. In this case. 
Um, I think the way it should be, you know, with a good relation to the musicians and to colleagues and discussing things, but there should be one person who takes the responsibility for the decisions. And that's both in case of phrasing of certain piece and also depending on the more general arc of, of development of the orchestra. And that's, I think that's simple and rather healthy way of relating to, you know, leadership. I, th I, think, I think it's a very, very good view of it. And because I, I remember uh, my late dear friend, Maris Janssens years ago complaining that even in his incredibly successful 19 uh, year Tesla, he found it very difficult to uh, have a strong say in, uh, you know, in the choice of guest conductors or even in the choice of the soloist, it's everything had to go through a committee. And I always, you know, uh, discussed that with him. And I said, I don't quite understand how could that work successfully? Because uh, the art, even though there are some art forms like films, my God, I mean, it's an army mm -hmm. of people you have, but it's still, even in, even in the film, industry where there's so much more money and so many more people but it's a director's idiot uh, you know uh it's director's medium director is the one who yes. has the yeah, vision mm. you know but of course in our case i mean the composer we have the holy of holies you know the uh the the source the material so that's that's composer one usually composer is the one who composes it one performer who decides how it's going to be yeah because you cannot have you know a committee on interpretation even string quartets have you know endless discussions but ultimately there has to be somebody who decides that's how yeah. we're going to do it it might be wrong maybe you could be a hundred other interpretations but this is the way i see it yeah and that singular vision that what makes what we're talking about that makes a difference and you really put your imprint on, on, the, on the group of players. Now, let me turn the attention uh, to, you know, to the young performers today, because you, as much as I can always uh, view you as a young performer, but you no longer so young and you're in the position of a senior, uh, you know, you're in a senior position where you can hire, you you can fire to a certain degree, but you can suggest, you can take new pieces. What would be the best way for the young performers today to be heard and noticed? Is it still competitions, auditions? Or now it moves more towards online materials, like website, YouTube that we're talking to you mm -hmm. now on, or other social media? What's, what's your view on that? I think social media and um, and the material which is in uh, in a digital form which you can send around uh, mm -hmm. if you are asked for it um, I think that's uh, something you can't really I mean um, it's without that it's hard to function it's it's a wonderful yeah. help I don't think it can be the only or should be the only the only thing you know that you if you overdo it like you know spreading pushing uh, the material uh, everywhere um, it's it, the opposite effect yeah uh, people like me sometimes maybe hopefully i'm trying to be extremely diplomatic uh, um, are starting having allergy on on those <clears throat> on those because somehow it has become possible to create a social media profile uh, of an artist, which is not based on the actual performing skills. Very much so. I, I just, you know, I've seen few few of them and uh, it makes me slightly sad. But again, you know, there are people who are um, not able to, you know, for example, per participate in, in a competition or they are living in a place which is so... Um, a distant so i don't know whatever and then you find them by by an accident 
by chance you see something on YouTube and you are astonished and then this is how things could start happening and it's it's fantastic so I'm I'm more you know a bigger fan of, of that kind of uh, development is that kind of Absolutely. model but the competitions uh, actually one young conductor did ask me that actually exactly the same question um, that should I go to the competition but actually if you look at your options as a conductor for example um, uh, if you don't go to competition you have to create your own orchestra um, you know like then um, x x x x x do everything needed without orchestra to become something and then you are able to present yourself as a conductor so yes you should go to the competition <laughs> and uh, and uh, as a as a player as an instrumentalist i still believe in i still believe in in competitions it's uh, it's a great way first of all it makes you better you prepare for competitions you practice a lot you you know you build your um, uh, performing skills, your nerves, uh, a large uh, repertoire. It's a great way of, uh, you know, developing. So there is nothing wrong about that. Now, the competitions can be problematic, obviously, uh, and they are not objective. So people who, especially young people who tend to think that if I'm good, I'll be the winner. That doesn't exactly work like that, unfortunately. Many times, yes, but Almost as many times it doesn't. And uh, that's just, the, I guess, that's the game. That's the, that's the business. It, 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 it functions the same way in a concert life. You know, sometimes things just don't go the way they should go. And you have to accept that. I guess that also builds you up as a person, as a personality, musical personality. Yeah, it thickens your skin. Yeah. so to speak yeah. you know you become more uh, uh, you know resistant to uh, so-called failures or mm, things that should be happening but they're not happening and uh, you know because nobody owes anybody anything and it's all based on individual highly uh, you know highly personal opinion yes and and the ones who don't have personal opinions, they, they, all they need is to click a few things and read about somebody else's personal opinion. Yeah. Form. And that's where the social media plays a very influential part is not because somebody expressed, it's just the ones without the opinions, they read those opinions. It's like reviews in the, in the paper of uh, new films, new TV. Oh, no, 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 this one got bad review doesn't mean anything take a look at least for two minutes maybe yeah. you like it maybe you'll hate it after a great review said, oh god how could <coughs> I give a good review so yeah. it's the same thing you know somebody wrote oh yeah this is it but of course and one doesn't doesn't believe the uh endless letters of recommendation you have to know how to read between the lines you know and uh it's, it's the the best the best of course example we've mentioned that giant before was Shostakovich, the best and the worst example, because his signature was under every possible yeah. paper that was asked of him to sign. And Sh Rodion Shedrin, wonderful a Russian composer, a very a close personal friend of mine, he told me a, a story about him and Shostakovich, how he uh, asked him to, you know, to help uh, from early retirement a certain dancer uh, in, in St. Petersburg. And so Shostakovich, without hesitation, put his name to it. And it, it had an effect because he was a member of the Central Committee already, you know, his yeah. position. And, he, and Shostakovich himself told him this story that once uh, on the way back from uh, St. Petersburg, he was in the same compartment with the all-powerful uh, uh, first secretary of Leningrad, uh, party committee. And so they started drinking. I said, oh, uh, Maestro Shostakovich, or uh, Comrade Shostakovich, rather, said, why did you write, uh, why did you sign that letter for this really no good over the hill? So why do you support him? He said, you know what? I sign anything that's in, put in front of me. <laughs> and he looked at him like this. 
And it was true. So his signature of such giant, imagine Beethoven's signature, yeah, would mean, meant absolutely nothing. Leave me alone. Leave me yeah. alone. I don't want to know. I don't want to know. So, you know, it's these days, of course, we constantly ask. I just, the other night, I, last night or the night before, I, 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 yeah, I wrote yet another letter of recommendation to a colleague. How can you say no if somebody, if it might help? So, but uh, the other thing, how do you see, that's another difficult question I'm going to ask you before I stop torturing you, but it's, it's, it's important to know your perspective. Um, how do you see, we're still in the middle of this pandemic, but there's some rays of hope. Uh, but do you think we might, is there a chance we become wiser, stronger, and maybe appreciate the live contact much more after not being able to communicate directly with the public for such a long time. Is there hope for that? Well, for sure, I I, I will be. Um, it's hard to talk, you know, for, on behalf of other people, but yeah, I was so hungry for, and I'm still very hungry for performing for people. That uh, now that actually in Galicia, since uh, three week, two weeks we were able to have 250 people in our um, hall. Actually, it's not a hall, it's a coliseum, which can hold up to 4,500 people with safety distances. So there, 250 people, it's not very much, but still, when they were there, it's such an incredible feeling. And, and this is, I would have never been able to experience this if there was no pandemic. And I, as many musicians and my colleagues as I'm talking to about this, they all say the same. I mean, we all miss the same thing. And people from outside our sector, outside our, let's say, profession, they, I don't think they really get it. Um, I think they look at it as uh, musicians, they just want to, you know, uh, they want to get back to performing, uh, you know, get, get their money and, uh, so that everything would be as before. Um, they don't really kind of put two and two together that, that us and the, and the public, we are in uh, actually directly dependent on each other. Um, and especially the public, which does not get any um, life culture um, becomes less and less uh, healthy mentally. That's, that's, that's not my invention. It's, it's, it's a fact. <laughs> Talking about it's facts. Fact. Uh, it's, it, fact. it, it's just, uh, you know, we are, we are animals who are, you know, meant uh, to function as a group. If we don't, and uh, in, in this case, our society, well, becomes fractured more and more anyway. Uh, has become last couple of decades because we can do anything sitting at home. And now especially, like we don't need anybody. We can play concerts uh, without audience and we can write books and sell them and get reviews for them. And, uh, and then, you know, we can do anything. And at the same time, it just makes us uh, less and less human beings. Uh, yeah. It's the interaction. It's interaction on stage and its interaction between the audience and, and especially within the audience. It's a social experience of listening to music together with the other people, which does not exist now and has not existed for one year. Uh, and that is a catastrophe to, to my taste. And, and it's, um, it should be viewed as, as strongly as environmental problem uh, of the planet. Um, I think it's it's the same. If we will handle the handle the the global warming, but will not have the fully functional uh, cultural life, the 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 outcome will will not be much better. Will will be pretty miserable because we it will profoundly change. Uh, I think the psychology of uh, mental health. Of, of human being because we're so much also depend on exchange of energy because music 
is yeah. a, is the art of communication. We exchange it. We generate the sound. We expend you know a lot of hours of preparation, but also at that point, uh, with great deal of, of adrenaline and energy, we e exchange energy, and they give us that energy back. We also now totally uh, you know denied of any kind of tactility. You know, we are very tactile being. Some cultures much more, especially Russians. You know, they always, you know, you, it's important. If you look in the zoo, you know, how our, you know, historical ancestors, yeah. the yeah. monkeys, how much they need just to hold each other, just to hug each other, yeah. you know, to remind that they're not alone. Yeah. You know, that, that tactile uh, connection has been removed. You know, we, we're all in masks and we're not allowed to touch each other. That's already a serious change in in our behavior. Yeah. And if we're not allowed for, you, you see, I just read a, an article just this morning in the Times. I mean, the film industry, TV is way up. They're producing incredible amount because this audience has doubled, tripled. Yeah. Because we're all watching those TV series and movies now on, the, on our screens. But that's a different media. What they totally forget that we do need that live contact. And unless, as you said it so clearly, unless that's been restored, it will seriously affect us as human beings, as, as, as human race. So on that sort of warning, I want to still be hopeful that we'll be able to somehow uh, bring that back, maybe not as quickly as we would like, but eventually to have the new normal, whatever it is. And I hope to see you in real life, not only on the screen, like and what? to be able to, uh, to see you on stage and uh, at the table, and just to be able to be in the same space together, not, not only online. In the meantime, thank you so much, Dima, for taking the time from your family, from uh, your downtime on the Sunday. Let's wish uh, all our Jewish friends happy Passover because yes. that's what it is now. Right. And uh, I hope to see you very, very soon. And thank you for all the listeners and uh, for your good questions. And don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel and watch and listen to a lot of musical content. And of course, all these programs, it's been already 14 now, including this one's yeah. just a good series. So see you in a week and thank you again. Thank you, Dima. And, and thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you.